Hey everyone, I'm Julie Gunlock, host of the Bespoke Parenting Hour. For those new to the program, this podcast is focused on how parents should custom tailor their parenting style to fit what's best for their families, themselves, and most importantly, their kids. So since the death of George Floyd last year, there have been there has been a big push, particularly in blue cities, to defund the police. And there's a variety of ways really creative ways uh, that city councils are doing this. They're cutting budgets, reassigning officers to other duties. And in many cases, they're removing police officers entirely from schools. That's exactly what happened in my own city of Alexandria, Virginia, a few months ago. And interestingly, this was done by a city council in opposition to what the school board wanted. And despite the request of many school principals, parents, and even students who pleaded with the council to keep the officers in place. It was quite a thing to watch um, them defund and actually remove, cut the budget, cut the budget for SROs in light of so much opposition. It's also important to note that my city's council did this despite an extraordinary spike in in in-school crime, specifically a 19% increase in violent crime in the city of Alexandria itself. So why is this happening? Why the push to take security and safety out of schools? So here to talk to me about this and many other issues is IWF senior fellow Laura Carno. Laura is a political media strategist, and she's the founder and executive director of Faster Colorado, an organization that trains armed K-12 school staff at no cost to the school. Through her media company, I Am Created Equal, Laura helped to recall the Colorado State Senate president in 2013 over his gun control agenda and his refusal to give his constituents a fair hearing. Brava. Laura also founded a local government watchdog organization in Colorado Springs, Colorado called SpringsTaxpayer.com that protects the interests of taxpayers from government overreach. Laura is the author of one of my favorite books, the government, uh, it's called Government Ruins Nearly Everything, Reclaiming Social Issues from Uncivil Servants, great title. She is a regular in Colorado media and national media as well. Laura, thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Um, Laura, you do so much for IWF as a senior fellow, and you cover a lot of the gun control issues. And this is certainly related to that, um, and and certainly what you do training teachers. So I want to talk a lot about that issue. But first, I wanted to just get your opinion, you know, about this SRO issue. Um, You sent me an article earlier in the week um, uh, that was written, an op-ed that was written by Mo Kennedy. He's the head of the National Association of School Resource Officers. And he wrote in this op-ed that so far this year, 33 school districts have kicked out SROs. And he says that that is a dangerous trend and that essentially these schools are announcing to the world that they are a soft target. We are not that many years away from Parkland, from the other school shootings that we have seen. And clearly with the Parkland school shooting, we saw that we needed really well-trained SROs. The SROs at that school were not well-trained. But the evidence does show that SROs are a very important security measure in schools. Why are school districts doing this? Why do they not see that they are making schools more dangerous? Yeah, and, and let's first say that, that the reason, and, and Mo Kennedy from the National Association of School Resource Officers, he is, he is absolutely correct that, that when, when they say they're getting rid of them, it really leaves a soft target there, and, and you're announcing that you're a soft target. Yeah. But the reason that school resource officers or other um, um, armed um, adults um, um, are good in school is if crime happens in school, and we're talking, and we're not talking if somebody you know steals a pack of gum out of somebody's backpack. We're talking about violent crime. Having somebody there who can deal with it um, reduces the incidence of those crimes, and, um, and and somebody is there quickly to stop it. And you know this can be anything from an assault all the way up to a school shooting that that are so tragically um, on our TVs. So so. Uh, most people can agree that having somebody there is good. What we're seeing in these 33 school districts um, that have kicked their school resource officers out and the many, many, many more who have talked about it is there is this um, concept of 
we need to stop the school to prison pipeline. And this is not a it's not something I'm advocating. This is what the folks are saying who want well, to and this, move. And I'm sorry to interrupt, but this goes back to Arnie Duncan and Obama. This kind of chatter started during the Obama administration. This isn't new. You know, this is this is sort of this prison or school to prison pipeline as that is that is a talking point that's been around for quite a while. Yeah, absolutely. And when um, I call it the summer of love last year, when um, all of the the big <laughs> cities were erupting in these uh, in these um, riots, um, and a lot of cities, um, people in some of these bigger cities were talking about defunding the police and eliminating police. Um, it it added some fuel to the fire, so to speak, to this. Let's remove SROs from. Um, from schools, because school resource officers, for folks who don't know, they are actually members of your local police department or sheriff's office. Um, So they are an actual member of law enforcement, sworn member of law enforcement, who spends um, part of his or her day or all of his or her day in a school. Um, So so it it kind of wrapped itself, um, got wrapped into this defund the police movement. Yeah, I'm so glad that you backed up, backed us up. I, I, I tend to sometimes lo- just launch into a conversation about something without sort of explaining, for instance, acronyms. Um, SRO stands for S- School Resource Officer, correct? Correct. Yes, correct. SRO, and, and they and they, and they have yeah. different. They have different. I mean, some some schools don't call them SROs. They have different words for them. But these are the people. I, you know, I, I think people also just assume school resource officers. All they do is, you know, sort of look for the school shooter, or they, you know, they, um, they, you know, they head off violent crime. But school resource officers, for instance, in Alexandria, Virginia, we have a really huge problem with MS thirteen. That is a, obviously, a gang. Um, that is very active in my community, and they do recruitment at the in Northern Virginia high schools. The Washington Post, I'm sorry, middle schools too, middle schools and high schools. And the Washington Post has even reported on this. This is a, a very well known problem in the Northern Virginia and Washington D.C. area, and also probably parts of Maryland. And, and Alexandria, Virginia, just a uh, just at a park that I literally used to walk my kids to. Um, a dead body was dumped in that park and it was a gang related MS 13 murder. And, and so, I mean, this is in my community. And so one thing that the SRO officers also do in our local schools is sort of look out for that recruitment and gang activity and really are a resource for the police groups that, you know, there are sort of task forces that follow this stuff in Northern Virginia and DC and Maryland and, um, and they can really offer information on those recruitment efforts. So, you know, when people think um, that SROs are only there to get, you know, get, you know, uh, minority children in trouble, they, they do more than that. They do, they do an awful lot of protecting of the community in a larger sense. Right. And, and the other thing that a lot of folks don't think of because it's never really documented um, unless somebody does a, a feel-good story on something, um, in some cases, um, the SRO might be the only positive uh, role model that somebody sees from a law enforcement. That's standpoint. right. They might live in a high crime neighborhood where they're often seeing um, neighbors being arrested or something like that. So, so to help um, kids develop uh, some kind of a positive association with law enforcement um, that is very helpful. Right. Um, you know, vast majority of the time they're not arresting people. Yes, that that is really important. I think. Um, I, I think uh, I, again. I just think it's important that people understand that SROs serve multiple purposes, um, and they're often, you know, I think um, stigmatized as these sort of villains in the story, as um, you know somehow contributing to this uh, so-called pipeline, um, which, you know, when you think about what is going on in schools and crimes that happen in schools and the criminals who are actually, um, you know, uh, committing these crimes, these are complicated issues that deal with family dynamics, the lack of discipline in the household. um, And it really bothers me when you get these catchy phrases like, you know, the school to jail pipeline, um, that ignores everything else that might contribute to a child committing a crime um, on school property 
Um, so it's it's frustrating because we often don't have what I think are are the complicated conversations, and that leads to these kinds of uh, so, so-called solutions, like pulling the SROs entirely out of the school, leaving the school vul- vulnerable, leaving children vulnerable to you know potential violence from from other ch- from other students, um, or a mass shooter kind of situation where the, where no one will be able to help. And in view of this, Laura, in view of this ridding the schools of SROs, it makes what you are doing so much, so much more important in my, in my opinion. Tell me about your efforts to help train teachers who have chosen to be armed in the school, on school grounds. Sure. So, and I'll um, just do a baseline um, uh, quick conversation about the law. So I am here in Colorado um, where it has been lawful for school boards um, and charter school boards to designate armed staff, and that law has been in place for about 17 years. Um, 34 states across the country um, have some lawful path um, for for, um, school staff to be armed, so it's different in different states, but some lawful path. Um, Not all of them follow it, but there are many, many states in the country that have armed school staff, Colorado being one of them. Um, uh, What we do, my organization, Faster Colorado, understanding that that we've got lots of armed staffers out there and also understanding that they've been getting training, um, and it's adequate training, but um, who among us wants adequately trained um, armed staffers when we can have extremely well-trained uh, armed staffers. So, so we saw that gap in there that um, we, we really want them to have world-class training so that if, God forbid, the worst happens on their campus, um, they can respond and save lives. So um, I, in tw- 2016, I attended a class in Ohio um, by Faster Saves Lives. They sort of kicked off this whole concept um, in the days following Sandy Hook. And uh, I ended up bringing that here to Colorado in 2017. So we're going into our fifth training year. And um, we say armed teachers, but just to dispel any um, weirdness around, around that, it's any armed st- uh, school staffer in a K-12 campus. So um, statistically, we're seeing 40% are actually teachers in a classroom. The other 60% do something else, um, which it does make a difference tactically because they're not, they don't have to think about, do I respond to gunfire somewhere, or do I protect my students? And you know, that's a, a, a big decision for, um, for folks to have to make, given whatever the details are of the situation. Um, but we've got principals, janitors, counselors, um, school nurses. We even have a lunch lady, um, bus drivers. So lots of different positions yeah. throughout school, um, which, you know, if you're, if you're a principal or a superintendent thinking about how you're deploying your security team on a daily basis, kind of where in the school are they, um, you know, that does make a difference. You have some that are in classes, classrooms, and some who are um, anywhere at any given time. You know, I hear a lot. Um, uh, I live in. I like to say I live in the deepest blue on the uh, city. On um, it's like the deepest blue on the color wheel. You know, if you go to a paint mm-hmm. store and you're looking for a dark <laughs> blue, mine is right before black. Okay, so I live in a deep blue city where you know even people get squirrely if a kid is holding a you know a, a Nerf gun. Okay. Yeah. And so I, so I, I, I'm thinking of this from my person, my sort of the parents that live around here. Um, you know, they, they would say something like kids will be frightened if they see their teacher with a gun. How, what, what's the response to that kind of comment? Yeah. It, interesting in Colorado, because we, it's a very different culture. Um, as far as lots of folks are concealed carry holders here. Um, I say in Colorado, you know, don't think that kids have never seen firearms on their parents' hip. Yeah. Um, but in, in other parts of the country, like you're talking about on the, the deep blue on the color wheel, um, everywhere that I have been aware of armed staff programs throughout the country, it is 100% concealed carry. And it's a deep concealment. It's not something where if the, the breeze flaps open your jacket that um, everybody's going to see it. Um, it is a deep concealment. So, well, Explain so, deep concealment to me. 
Yeah, so there are, um, gosh, we could do two hours on holsters. Um, <laughs> there, there, are, um, there are lots of places on a person's body um, to be able to carry a firearm, and, and not all of them are just on the hip um, where, like I say, a breeze could um, easily um, uh, blow open a jacket and, and see that. Um, so, um, and there's a lot that we don't telegraph publicly, um, but there are a lot of places on a person's body that are very well hidden um, by their clothing. And, right. um, you know, we even think about it like a kindergarten teacher whose little ones come in every day and, and hug her. Um, that, that kindergarten teacher needs to think differently about where she might be carrying um, right. so that nobody bumps into it and says, you know, hey, what's that? So right. um, lots of different discussions about that. And they, class, and they have, sure. and, and I think, and Laura's right not to, to, to detail this too much, but they do, they are re- it's really interesting. It's like any technology, um, you know, if there's a demand for it, they will, they will, someone will design something. And so obviously these concealments are designed in a way to serve different Pop demographics, and so there's going to be ones that are more suitable for a teacher who might be around children, um, and and again, where physical touch might be a thing. And so, um, it's really interesting that these products um, and p- products have innovated to the degree that they can they can provide they can provide a teacher the ability to conceal carry, and and still be around children. So I think it's important that parents know that it's not like bonanza where there's a six shooter on their hip and like, you know, it's hanging down like on a belt that doesn't, you know, that kind of hangs down. This isn't the kind of thing we're talking about. It is, it's, as you say, deep concealment. Um, you know, I think that's also an, a reason, um, to talk to your kids though. It, it is, it's interesting that you say, you know, here in Colorado, you know, a lot of, you know, people, it, it wouldn't be unusual to actually see a gun on some, you know, it's, it's concealed carry, but you might see it if the wind does flap a jacket in the, in the wind and you can see it, it, that wouldn't spook a kid because it's more common out there. But I do think it's interesting in some of these deep blue cities where it's like guns are so verboten that they, they don't even see any good reason. And, you know, it's, it's, it's complete. And, and that is what, when you say like, you're announcing, you know, we talked about earlier, you're announcing to the world that you're a soft target. There are, there are good reasons to, to arm yourself. And it's specifically because of criminals not caring that it's a gun free zone or right. that it's a, a school where guns aren't allowed. So, um, so I, I, you know, I, I think that it's, it says something to parents that perhaps educating your kids on the proper use of guns, on where guns can help people, can save lives. You know, that might be, that might be the conversation to have instead of objecting to a teacher who wants to defend themselves when they're a sitting duck in, in a classroom. And I also want to talk to you a little bit about, you know, we've had kids home for an entire year now. My kids have not stepped into a classroom in over a year. Um, and you know, I, I, I want to talk a little bit about how in school administrators, you talk to these people, you train these people, you know, are they worried a little bit about the behavioral issues um, from kids who've really been out of a social setting for so long? What is the thinking on that from some of these school folks? Yeah, 100% correct. They're truly, um, I, I actually did a, a TV interview on this, um, gosh, maybe six months ago about the concern that when kids come back to school, whenever that was at the time, um, and th- there was so much untreated mental illness out there. There were parents who were struggling and unable to help their kids going through emotional difficulties. What happens when they all come back to school? And um, you know, if there are these, these people who are in need of mental health or um, are having other issues that um, take them to that extent of wanting to harm their teachers and their fellow students, They've been sitting around home for a long time, yeah, yeah. With lots of time to plan. So it's a, a big concern. Interestingly, um, when we move into the summer months, and this is kind of our prime training season, um, we have fewer new schools coming on online because, you know, and when I say coming online, that means passing the policy uh, through their school board um, to arm staff in the fall, for example. Um, we, we usually don't see tons of activity in the summer. Um, but because kids went to school 
um, it, it, just depending on where you were, you know, in, in the late spring, for example, uh, administrators and school boards were going, uh-oh, we're having more of these kind of social-emotional issues going on, and it has caused more folks to be thinking about it. I've been going to a lot of school board meetings, a lot of executive yeah. session of school board meetings to have these discussions, far more than I have any other year um, in the summer. That is so concerning. And, you know, look, we know that kids are really dealing with depression and anxiety. Rates of suicides are up. It's really pretty horrifying to think of what kids have been through. I mean, in, in here in Alexandria, Virginia, the number of children who just literally stopped going to school stopped. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'll tell you, I, you know, I, I, I have one child in the public schools. He's, this is his last year. Next year, he's going to be going to a Catholic school as are my other children, but they, they, he, you know, it is really hard at this, these are the last couple of days of school, it's summer out, we, you know, we like to go to the pool. It's really hard to get, uh, to keep him motivated. And yet there are a lot of parents who aren't home to constantly sort of tap them on the shoulder and make sure they're in their class. And so the rate of children who've completely abandoned school, and then and you have some school districts that aren't really even giving out grades, aren't really tracking this, and are just going to kind of scoot kids off into the next grade, like act like this didn't happen. And you think about the anxiety um, they're going to have when they go into that next grade and they, and, and they really had educational losses the year before. So I really worry about kids' mental health. Um, and, and I, 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 I'm so sad to see that instead of helping faculty, school faculty prepare for what everyone hopes never happens, um, but, you know, violence um, from, uh, you know, a mentally unstable ch- um, student, you know, instead of preparing the faculty and staff for that, that hopefully a non-incident, hopefully it no- doesn't happen, but instead they're getting rid of the SROs. They're not providing any training, at least, in, again, these deep, deep blue cities like I live in. They're not helping the teachers defend themselves. They're not preparing them. Instead, what, what, my school district spent the summer doing is equity training and critical race and how to how to teach critical race theory. I mean, it is completely bonkers the priorities and how jumbled up everything is. Um, so it's it it really is sort of a a troubling time. I I want to kind of go through a few more of these myths that I hear about you know teaching and training teachers. One of other common myth I hear is that teachers don't have the right mindset, right? That only police officers should, should arm them or should be, you know, I I love this argument because they say only police officers, you know, should be armed and only police officers have the right mindset. And then they strip the schools of the police officers. So, okay. But besides that, (laughs) um, you know, but there, but there are some schools that have SROs, um, and, and, and are not moving to remove them, but they don't want to train teachers. And I've heard you talk about this, how it's important that SROs have backup for goodness sake, or have, you know, they, that, that they have, a, you know, help in, in defense. Often these are very big schools. So talk to me a little bit about that sort of idea, um, that teachers can't be trained to do this kind of work or to do this uh, with this other skill, essentially. Yeah, it's funny that we hear so often from um, from let's say the te- general world of the teachers unions um, how amazing teachers yeah. are and all of this kind of stuff. <laughs> but apparently, there's one skill they're co- they're you know, um, <laughs> incapable of learning. I don't understand that defending uh, themselves. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't. Yeah, it's it's crazy. Um, so so there are some national polls that show that only eight percent of school staff approve of a policy like this, and that's fine because it, it it's not like any school out there has 100% of their staff armed because it is a voluntary position. So when a school does this, they say, you know, we're going to be doing this policy. Come see me privately if you'd like to be part of the team. And, you know, what I keep hearing from principals is, oh, I never knew that Mrs. So-and-so was a gun owner um, because it's just not something that um, is talked about in the teacher's lounge typically. And, um, but yeah, they're, it, you know, you look at all of the concealed carry holders out there, and it's a, uh, about 9% of our population here in um, Colorado, 9% of adults have a, a concealed carry permit. Um, does anybody honestly think that none of those people work in schools? Of course they work in schools. Um, you know, people who work in schools are just like everybody else. They, you know, some, some have firearms for self-defense and some don't. Um, so the ones who raise their hand and say, I'd like to be a part of that program, they already have that mindset. 
and um, and we take them through a significant amount of training on mindset um, as as well as the the firearm skills that they need. But let's not um, kid ourselves. Every one of these um, horrific school shootings that we've seen, we see firsthand that the school staff um, has the right mindset because what do they keep doing? They keep putting their bodies between yeah. bullets and children yeah. every single time, Julie. And, and so we know they want to save children. Um, we just think that for those who choose um, to have a firearm, that they um, should have that right yeah. um, to be able to stop the threat, save the children, and go home to their families. And, yes. and, and, and that self-defense aspect is not um, often talked about. We, we do talk about the, the safety of the children, which is great. It's, it's, it's a, a, primary, uh, a primary thing we should be thinking about. But um, what about the self-defense rights of those who work in, in schools? Absolutely. Where they're sitting Absolutely. ducks? What, how, yeah. why, why are they okay a mile away defending themselves in a grocery store, but they, they go to work? Um, which is a gun-free zone, which killers don't care about. Yeah, well, and then all of a sudden they can't defend themselves. Yeah, and, you know, as far as my city council, it's been nothing but teachers are heroes, teachers are wonderful, teachers are, tre- tre- are, are tremendous. You know, thank a teacher, love a teacher, all this. It's been very, very supportive of the teacher community. And then they pull the SROs out the very year that they're going to have kids returning to a classroom who might have significant mental health problems. I just don't understand this. And then again, you know, teachers are so great. Teachers are so wonderful, but they're not allowed to defend themselves. It's an absolute sickening double standard. And I, frankly, it, it frustrates me. I, I, I Look, I get Randy Weigarten and I know the teachers unions are, you know, like a wildly liberal union. But um, for all the talk about defending teachers and taking care of teachers, they sure don't care about one aspect of teaching which is quite risky and that is that is teaching you know potentially teaching a child who is mentally unstable and could bring violence and look the the uh, it's not just you know these mass casualty events teachers deal with assaults the the rates of assaults on teachers um is you know is 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 quite high it's something that we don't hear a lot about in the media i've read a couple articles where they, there, there just isn't a lot of information about that stuff because they tend to keep it pretty quiet. Um, but, you know, I, I do worry about teachers in this situation and, and I wish we heard more from teachers and, you know, maybe in, maybe in, in more conservative areas of the country that is discussed, um, but, but it certainly isn't here. So, um, you know, I, I think, again, you've got these different myths out there that help sort of um, support the idea of teachers should not be armed. Um, And one of the other myths that we hear about is cops not knowing who the bad guy is if a teacher also has a gun. So if you have this, one of these sort of school shooting situations um, and you know, the, the, the police officers and the SROs are trying to, you know, deal with this. The idea being that uh, here comes a teacher who's armed trying to help the situation and then the teacher gets shot. Tell us the training surrounding that situation. Sure. And it's important to first note that most of these situations are over within a few minutes and typically law enforcement response time is a few minutes times two, three, four, five or more, depending on how rural the school district is. So, so the likelihood of a, um, um, of, of that link up with law enforcement going badly is a little bit less in a situation like this, yet we, we significantly train around this. Um, first, we tell the, the armed staffers it is their job not to get shot by the police. Um, it, it, the, the cop, if a cop comes in and sees somebody with a gun, they believe that that person is a threat, and, and um, the folks that we train uh, know that, and it's right. their job not to get shot. So again, we don't telegraph all of our um, specific tactics. Um, we don't want the bad guys to hear them. Um, but there are a lot of um, uh, there. There could be somewhat similar to law enforcement dealing with um, somebody who's off-duty law enforcement out of uniform, um, who is intervening in a crime, that sort of thing. So there are some similarities. And because our instructors are all active duty law enforcement trainers, they, they do academies, they train SWAT teams, they know this stuff very well from a law enforcement standpoint, and they teach our armed staffers um, the same thing that, that they teach cops in, in all of this, in, in not getting shot by cops, in, uh, right. in, uh, 
and how to stop active shooter threats, um, all of that stuff. Um, we're, we're teaching our folks the same thing that law enforcement's learning in the academy and on SWAT teams. It's interesting, a lot of these sort of myths that you hear, this sort of the teachers can't, this next one I'm going to ask you about kind of fits in this category too. It's this whole like, it's almost like treating teachers like they're morons and they can't figure this stuff out. You know, like, um, y- you know, that they're just going to, you know, they'll they'll just wander in there waving their gun. Like it's, it, it, it's sort of, insulting i guess how some of these myths m- make it seem like teachers are, are incapable of 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 doing the training and learning what needs to be to be learned essentially so it's it's kind of funny how how they sort of have a bad they they are they're they're tr- treating teachers badly in in sort of right. these myths that they promote another one is um uh, you know, I hear a lot, and I, I want to ask you um, specifically about SROs and the studies that are out there. You hear a lot from advocates who want SROs out of the schools. You hear a lot of this sort of, there's no evidence that SROs cut down on crime. There's no evidence that SROs do anything to help um, reduce rates of crime. You you hear all of these kind of talking points. Um what is the status of research on SROs? Is there solid, you know, data showing that SROs, I mean, it's kind of in some ways hard because a crime didn't happen. So it's kind of hard to measure, but is there good data on, I mean, I know you're not an expert in SROs necessarily, but is there any information on that that you're aware of? Yeah, there, there's some really good data out there about, it kind of covers a, a few of these topics. Um, on on these rampage killings um, and any other of the mass casualty events, whether it's in a school or a movie theater or, or what have you, um, if there is a presence of an armed person, so that could be a school resource officer, um, law enforcement, um, a, an armed citizen, and you know any anybody who is, is right. there armed coming to the aid um, that that the death count is in the single digits as opposed to the double digits. And so um, there's a, a, a school shooting that happened here in Colorado, not the big, not the big one at Columbine that um, was so devastating and, and sort of, you know, started everybody really paying attention to these things. Right. Um, but Arapahoe High School, um, and in, at Arapahoe High School, a disturbed student came in intending to do lots of carnage, um, there was a school resource officer um, on the campus. He sprinted for 46 seconds to get to the library where this happened. And um, um, one student lost her life, Claire Davis. Um, now, you can say it's better that only one student lost her life as opposed to 20 students, absolutely. But that one student, uh, Claire Davis, is the only important person to Claire's family. And so, so when you look at fewer deaths, are always better than more deaths, absolutely. So we are grateful that there was somebody armed on that campus. Yeah. Um, but a, it is a very fair question. This is why we do what we do, is that SRO, and by the way, nobody's faulting that SRO for not running fast enough. He was in a oh. very different part of the, the campus. Yeah. But um, this happened in the library. Had that been um, a campus that had other armed staff in addition yeah. to just or a, or a, or an armed librarian exactly so um, could Claire Davis's life have been saved and like you said we're never going to know um, we, we can't play a and B scenarios and see what happened but might there have been a chance and I say there might have been a chance and I, I think if that person had come through our faster training in Colorado um, a very good chance that they they could have stopped um, stopped Claire Davis's yeah, death yeah you know you just you think about um, some of these school shootings that you hear about, these are obviously very, very sick individuals. Um, but if they're, if they, in, in every case, I mean, even Parkland, which was so horrifying because of the inaction by the NR- SROs um, and the terrible training that they had um, and, and just, Frankly, the the lack of I mean I I I hate to to say it, but the sort of lack of courage on the part of some of those SRO uh, the, yeah. of, in that particular case, um, you know, 
it, but that doesn't, you know, that is, that is one case, but it, in a lot of um, these cases, they, these shooters were totally unchallenged in terms of being challenged by another armed person who can actually stop them. Um, right. Yeah. And, and um, it, you know, if you're, if you look at the scenario like happened in Parkland, like happened in, in Columbine and some other places, um, what is worse? If you're a parent or I'm a, I'm a grandmother now, think about my, my little ones going into school soon. Um, can you think of anything worse than a gunman killing child after child after child with nobody to stop him? Yeah. I, 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 want, I want some kind of a fighting chance for, yeah. for our kids, even if it's not mine or yours. For society's kids, we all feel these these um, massacres, when they happen, we all feel these deeply. They, they, they affect whole communities, and, and, our, um, and we want yeah. them to stop. And the, 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 the truth is, is that, you know, we have a society that culturally has got some pretty serious problems, okay? And we have, you know, uh, when you look at, at sort of the biographies of these shooters, you know, terrible family problems problems, um, you know, isolation, no, you know, very few fathers present in a lot of these cases and, and, you know, mental problems, like long records of mental problems. And so, um, and, you know, and again, like some of the, some other cultural issues, like I mentioned isolation and here we are coming off a year where children were really isolated, <laughs> much more isolated than any other time in their lifetimes. And, and yet we have a, this, this intersection of, you know, the George Floyd death setting off, you know, Black Lives Matter and all of these riots around the country. And then um, the isolation of kids, which has created all of these, um, you know, increased mental problems for, for children, um, you know, again, anxiety and depression. I am really worried about, you know, schools are so supposedly going to be fully open in the fall. And yet we have cities stripping um, schools of SROs. It is just the, it is just the most dangerous combination. And I really do worry about this. So I'm, I'm so glad that you're doing what you're doing, Laura. I think um, I firm, I firmly believe and I, uh, in, in arming teacher or giving teachers the choice, right? Giving teachers the choice to arm themselves to protect themselves and to protect their classroom. So I think what you're doing is so, so important, more important now than ever before. Um, tell people where they can learn more about your organizations. Sure. So, um, so in Colorado, you can go to fastercolorado.com. Um, and by the way, FASTER stands for Faculty Administrator Safety Training and Emergency Response. I like to think of the word FASTER as the faster you stop the killer. That's what I thought. Yeah. Stop the yeah. 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 Um, and we do bleeding control training too, by the way. But um, so wow. that's fastercolorado.com. And then if you're anywhere else in the country um, and you're interested in is this happening in your state, um, the mothership, as I call it, uh, fastersavelives.org is in Ohio. Um, they're who helped us get started here. And uh, we're running autonomously now, um, but they are also helping other states who want to do something like this um, as well. But um, in your kid's school district, talk to your administrators, talk to your school board, let them know that you want this option discussed. Um, and dif it's different in different states on how it gets passed, but um, make sure that they know that this is important to you. You want this option discussed in school board meetings, city council meetings, however it's done in your area. Um, you are the voter. You are the parent. You're hiring a school to um, educate your kid and keep them safe, and you want them returned home alive every day, not most days, and that's not too high a bar. So make sure that your your politicians and public servants know this. Laura, that's such a great message. And I think when I just want to sort of add on to that to say that this year, more than ever, we've seen parents get involved in their local schools. I think I think prior to this year, a lot of parents were like, yeah, I'll – I'll go to the yearly fundraiser, you know, I'll do some, some parent teacher conferences, but I'm, you know, I'm kind of checked out, whatever. And now boy, are people interested and people <laughs> really are paying attention. And so look, as, as the pandemic fades and, you know, we move on, I hope people stay active in their local communities. Um, I hope people, uh, you find new causes. And this is certainly one that is worth your time and effort. And so 
Um, I hope you'll, Laura, what, what's your, what's your Twitter and how can people find you specifically? Sure. So I'm um, on Twitter. I'm at Laura Carno, L-A-U-R-A-C-A-R-N-O. And my website is the same, lauracarno.com. And you can find my, um, my work on gun policy at um, iwf.org. I uh, try to keep folks up to date on what's going on federally with gun control and, and um, you know, some other cultural issues uh, regarding um, you know, the right to keep and bear arms and keep yeah. ourselves safe. Yeah, Laura does such great work for IWF on all of the gun policy issues. She writes a lot, um, at, keeping slightly busier now that Biden's in office. <laughs> we're tracking <Goodness> and <laughs> tracking, tracking all the all the craziness that's coming out of the Biden administration. Um, and I really enjoy uh, Laura's writing too on these subjects. So check her out at IWF. Laura, thanks again for coming on. Absolutely, thanks for having me, Julie. Thanks everyone for being here for another episode of the Bespoke Parenting Hour. If you enjoyed this episode or like the podcast in general, please leave a rating or review on iTunes. This helps ensure that the podcast reaches as many listeners as possible. If you haven't subscribed to the Bespoke Parenting Hour on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts, please do so so you won't miss an episode. Don't forget to share this episode and let your friends know that they can get Bespoke episodes on their favorite podcast app. From all of us here at the Independent Women's Forum, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.